spent on feeling good. A wino met me on the street. He said, help me find some sneaking pee. Help me, brother, I wish you were. I feel so bad and I want to feel good. That's the Levon Helm song just for Billy McConnell, who's obviously feeling good today because he's, his, his eyes are going back in his head. I think he's had plenty of pain medication today. <laughs> I love this. Uh, stand up just a second, Billy. Just, uh, just for a second. Easy, easy. Terry, just really easy, just for a second. Hey, there we go. Oh, you got that right. We're we're a little thin up here this morning, but you know we went we're, we went with the quality over quantity today, and uh, uh, Sean, Ricky, our backup bass player, are all gigging in Pensacola this weekend. Uh, I don't know where Kevin went. Where did he go? Tampa. California. Okay. T Tim uh, Tim is on the Appalachian Trail. Really, that's not a joke. He from a few years ago. He is on the Appalachian Trail dodging dodging bears, I think, today. And uh, so it's just us. And 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 you Matt's an old hand, but we've got Nate Deering up here. He just <laughs> We're gonna give him a few solos later and uh, <laughs> So help us out. Let's stand up and sing every move I make. <clears throat> Every move I make, I'm making you, you make me move. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you, you are my way. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Waves of mercy, waves of mercy, waves of grace. Everywhere I look, I see your face. Your love has captured me. Oh, my God, this love, how can it be? Every move, every move, you make me move, Jesus, every Every step, every step I take, I take in you, you are my way. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Waves, waves of mercy, waves of grace. Everywhere I look, I see your face. Your love has captured me. Oh, my God, this love, how can it be? Of mercy, 
waves of grace everywhere I look I see your face your love has captured me oh my God this love how can it be take a minute and greet your neighbor and tell him good morning got the whole world in his hands. He's 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 got a you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got He's got a you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. We're going to go back and do that last verse because there was some cheating going on. So only the men are singing. He's got you and me, brother. Everybody ready? Are all the men ready? He's got you and you and me, brother. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got the whole world. All right, ladies, just the ladies. He's got if you're 65 years or older, this is your verse. He's got sun. Oh my gosh. If you're 64 or younger, he's got. That's what I thought. There's no young people here. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. You may be seated. Your face is beautiful and your eyes are like the stars. Your gentle hands have healing there inside the scars. Your loving arms, they draw me near and your smile, it brings me peace. Draw me closer, oh my Lord, draw me closer, Lord, to Thee. Captivate us, Lord Jesus, set our eyes on You. Devastate us with Your presence, falling down. 
rushing river draw nearer holy fountain consume us with you captivate us lord jesus with you your voice is powerful and your words are radiant bright in your breath and shadow i will come close and abide you whisper love and life divine and your fellowship is free draw me closer oh my lord draw me closer lord to me captivate us lord jesus set our eyes on you devastate us with your presence for now and russian river draw nearer holy fountain consume us with you captivate us lord jesus with smile it brings me peace draw me closer oh my lord draw me closer lord to me captivate us lord jesus set our eyes on you devastate us with your presence fall down rushing river draw nearer holy fountain consume us with you captivate us lord jesus with you captivate us lord jesus I mean, Matt's okay, but I mean, he's tearing it up over here, aren't you, man? I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad he was, he, was, he was playing today. He came up to me last, after church last night, and he said, listen, I want to try out. And I said, you're in luck. Nobody's going to be here next week. Actually, I didn't know nobody was going to be here until I told him you were playing. And... Uh, <laughs> Hey, there you go. There you go. <laughs> love that. Love that. Uh, four years ago this week, Levon Helm passed away, and his family has kept his music going. And if you don't know that name right offhand, first of all, shame on you. But second of all, he uh, was the legendary drummer with the band. So if you've ever if you've ever heard the song uh, "Take a Load Off Annie." You know that one, yeah. Old and to Nazareth, feeling about half past dead. That one, you know. Uh, uh, no, Cripple Creek, the song Cripple Creek. Uh, what's some other ones there, Matt? Help me out. Um, the, the Last Wall, that's right. That's a great one. Just, uh, just a legendary uh, singer, and his family has asked, in North America, every gigging musician in North America do a Levon Helm song this week. So we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do one for you here, and then we're gonna do a couple during communion today. And uh, Levon didn't always write his music, but whenever he recorded another artist's written song, it just became his. And uh, this song here is called "The Mountain." It was written by Steve Earle, and uh, it's on uh, Levon's last album. 
And uh, his last album was recorded after he had, had been diagnosed with throat cancer. He was in his 60s. He was, uh, he'd already had multiple rounds of chemotherapy, and they had removed half of his vocal cords. And he could still sing this song three steps higher than where I'm singing it today. I mean, just uh, uh, incredible. Helm, H-E-L-M. I feel like that's the one I was trying to think. There's so many great songs. But uh, if you've ever heard the band, uh, you've heard him. And, and the other thing, Billy, is he, you know this, he'd sing these songs while playing drums wide open. So, uh, so we'll try to do this song justice for Lee Barnes. On it's a song called The Mountain. And uh, if I sing Feeling Good for, t for Billy... Terry, this one's for you. It's about the, a mountain in Kentucky. So there you go. <laughs> you got to leave on too. Feeling good was a leave on song. So. I'm sorry, we're just talking. We usually talk to each other closer and you don't understand what's going on. Dark and it's deep, and God only knows all the secrets it keeps. There's a chill in the air, only miners can feel. There are ghosts in the tunnels that the company see. I was born on this mountain. This mountain's my home, and she holds me and keeps me from worry and woe. Well, they took all she gave, and she gave it till she's gone. But I'll die on this mountain, this mountain's my home.
took all she gave and she gave it till she's gone but i'll die on this mountain this mountain's my You are starting to act like Stuart. See, you wander around. And you're... Uh, all the women. Your wife is sitting right back there with a seat for you, but no. That's all right. It's good, isn't it? It's been a it's been a busy week, news week here in the United States. The campaign and primaries for president continue, with New York getting most of that attention. Severe weather in the plains. Flooding in Texas, Harriet Tubman will be the new face of the $20 bill, if you haven't heard that. Volkswagen reached a settlement over its diesel cheating scandal. The first Michigan officials were charged with poisoning of the Flint water supply. And of course, the legendary performer of four decades, Prince, passed away at his Minnesota home. You know, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that the first concert I ever went to was a Merle Haggard concert. So when he died, it was like, oh, you cannot, you, this cannot be happening. The second concert I ever went to. No, I'm not going to say who the third one no. was. No. Now, in my fundamentalist family, to go see Merle Haggard was okay. I was smuggled into Atlanta to see Prince in 1988 or so. All of this has has overshadowed maybe the terrible events that are unfolding, continue to unfold in the country of Ecuador. A Richter scale 7.8 quake struck off the Ecuadorian coast last week. Now that's the same intensity as the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. So it's massive and it was nearly 10 times stronger than that earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010. And we are very familiar with the, uh, with the devastation there. As of this weekend, hundreds have been killed, nearly 10,000 injured. The aftershocks continue, and there is a growing concern that illness, particularly mosquito-borne illness, could kill more people in the aftermath of this earthquake than the quake itself. But there has been some incredibly much-needed good news to come out of Ecuador as well, like the story about Pablo Cordova. Pablo is 51 years old, and he manages a hotel in Ecuador, he was at work when the earthquake struck. The hotel collapsed into a stack of pancakes, essentially, and he was at the bottom of that stack beneath that pile. He survived for 36 hours when miraculously, somehow, cell service was restored. His phone was with him, as most of us always have a phone with us, and he had been periodically powering on the phone to see if there was a signal. So when he got a signal 36 hours in, the first person he called was his wife. And it was like getting a call from the grave. She had already picked out his coffin. <laughs> she took it back. <laughs> Rescuers were directed to his location, and he was pulled from the, from the rubble. And efforts like these go on for days after such disasters, with rescue teams racing the clock to save those who would otherwise be lost. My favorite such story comes from Armenia. In the late 1980s, an 8.2 earthquake flattened that country. It killed 30,000 people in four minutes. A father raced to his son's elementary school in the immediate aftermath where his eight-year-old son, Arman Gazarian, was a student. The father was devastated when he arrived because the four-story building was reduced to a heap of concrete. But the father went around to the back corner of the building where he knew his boy's classroom had been and he started digging with his bare hands, removing the rubble. 
other parents would come by, other officials would come by, and they would tell him, stop, this is madness, they're all lost, you can't do anything about it, they're all died, accept it. And every time someone would try to stop him, he would always ask him the same question, will you help me? And no one offered any help. For 12 hours, he dug. 24, 36. In the 38th hour, he pulled back a boulder and heard his son's voice. Armand, he cried out, and sure enough, it was his boy. And not just him, beneath the rubble, 14 of his classmates had miraculously survived. Armand would tell his father afterwards, I told the other kids not to worry that if you were alive, you would be here to save me. And if you came to save me, they would be saved as well. Today, Armand is 36 years old with a family of his own, all because of the persistence of a father who would not rest until what was lost was found. That is the exact message of Luke 15, a chapter that we have spent a few weeks in now, and it is our topic. Jesus is telling a collection of stories about lost things being found, lost sheep, lost coins, lost sons, lost people, lost causes. God, as loving Father, pursues those who He intends to rescue and restore. Now, last Sunday, we looked at verses 3 through 7, the story of the lost sheep. And there I emphasized the inherent value of each and every life. A single sheep in Jesus' day was a prized possession for food, milk, clothing, religious sacrifices, for all types of reasons that the hearers of Jesus who first heard Jesus' story would have understood. And losing just one of these important animals was a loss that no conscientious, responsible shepherd would take. If a sheep went missing, then the shepherd went seeking. And so we move on today to verses 8 through 10, a shorter story about a lost coin. And let us read those verses together. They are printed for you in your bulletin. Or suppose a woman, Jesus begins, has ten silver coins. And we are joining Jesus in the middle of this storytelling time to the religious and judgmental crowd who do not approve of his fraternizing with the sinners. So a woman has ten silver coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. The word of God for the people of God. Now, like his first story, Jesus uses what would have been familiar to his listeners. This woman's lost coin. Now, it could have been a denomination of money, representing in the economy of the day quite a paycheck. It could have been a part of a larger collection. People collected coins then, even as they collect now. It could have been part of, and many commentators believe it is this, that it was part of a priceless necklace or an heirloom that had been given to her. It could have been that this was this woman's only savings. The exact nature of the lost item is not as important as seeing that this was something very valuable, and she turns her house upside down until the coin is found. Now, we have more in common with the second story than the first. Not many of us, I would say, have any experience as shepherds. Uh, We don't know a whole lot about chasing down a lost sheep, but we can readily understand and identify with this woman's urgency. Anyone who has ever lost a diamond ring or a diamond from its setting or if you've ever lost a wedding band or a bracelet that was a family heirloom, maybe, then you know that frenzied near panic that you feel when you're looking for something that is lost. Or maybe I could add to it, if Jesus were telling the story today, your car keys or a contact lens. Or, God forbid, your cell phone. (laughs) Save us, O God, from such a grisly fate as that to lose a cell phone. Let a 16-year-old lose his or her cell phone, and you will see what a frantic search looks like. But ironically, 
those in that particular demographic are not as motivated to find other things that they have lost. When my son lost his glasses recently, I said, they're somewhere in your room. Find them. And of course, he went and looked for like, <laughs> they're not there. <laughs> and so I went in and found them in about five minutes. And he was like, whoa, how did you do that? And I said, it's real easy. You were looking for a pair of glasses. I was looking for $300. <laughs> right? When you know the value of something, it tends to motivate you to find it. Jesus' listeners knew how valuable this coin was. We know how valuable a lost check or a lost password or a lost cell phone or a lost diamond is. It's no little thing. You turn on the lights, you look under the bed, you lift up the area rugs, you scatter dust bunnies that haven't moved in years. It has to be somewhere. It couldn't have grown legs and walked off. Did your parents ever say that to you? And when we find what we have been looking for, when it's back in our hands or back in the bank or back in the safe or back on our finger or back in our pocket, we are so relieved we can hardly stand it. And just like this woman in the story, we start letting everybody know, everything's okay now, we found it. And if the recovery is significant enough, well, champagne bottles start getting opened and toasts are made and somebody's getting treated to dinner out of sheer joyful thanksgiving. And that's the scene. Now, the rabbis in Jesus' day had a proverb, a saying about coins. They said this, Blessed is the man who seeks after the law of God, as if searching for a lost coin. And you see what Jesus does with this little proverb, this little saying. He hijacks it and uses it for his own purposes. He makes it clear that it is God who chases after the lawbreakers, not necessarily the other way around, because God sees in the lost what their true value is and will do whatever it takes to bring them back. God longs for, God loves the worship and the devotion of his people. That's without a doubt. But God is not a needy, clingy, codependent creature that is held hostage by some emotional reliance upon the saints. He loves and seeks the sinner, the broken, the rebel, the one who lives his life or her life that hurts himself or herself and hurts others, those who have wasted their days those who have wasted the love shown to them, those who never seem to miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. It's just one of those things that God gets after to recover. People, and when they are recovered, then heaven rejoices. More specifically, God rejoices. Now look at Luke 15, 10 again. In the same way, like a coin or a lost sheep being recovered, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one, one sinner repents. You do know that we have misapplied and misinterpreted this, this, this verse. A sinner repents and they say, and the angels rejoice. Wrong. Read it again. There is joy in the presence of God's angels. The angels are witnesses to the joy. They're watching so who is it that is happy? God himself. Now, I, th I would think that to be an angel would be a happy job. Don't get me wrong. I think they're probably happy. But the joy in the presence of God's angels is the joy of God himself that one of his has been recovered. Now, the parables of Jesus are sometimes referred to as holy jokes. I love that that there is a punchline coming that the crowd does not anticipate. And usually, the butt of the holy jokes are the teachers of the religious law and the religious crowd because Jesus is sending zingers at them one after another. And here, he does the same. They seethe and they wallow about in their indignation, angry at the sinners, angry that Jesus is a friend to sinners. They wag their heads and mumble to one another about how inappropriate all of this is. And meanwhile, God could not be more happy. He is gleeful, downright giddy, 
God grinning from ear to ear because what and who was lost has been found. And this pattern seems to be exactly that, a pattern, a norm, the way it is, the way it has been, and the way it always will be, I suppose. God intends that His kingdom be more like a party than a funeral. Redemption is a joyful, celebratory thing. New life is being born into the world. The lost are found. The blind can see. The dead are made alive again. And religion stands by angrily with its arms crossed, disapproving of the whole operation. For the comparison I've used in the past, though not exactly like this, religion more often than not plays the role of Statler and Waldorf. You know those guys? Those are the two old men who sit in the balcony during the Muppet show. <laughs> Statler and Waldorf, named after New York City hotels, by the way. Everyone at the show is having a wonderful time, except them. They heckle the performers. They trash the producers. They make fun of the guests each week. They complain and gripe all the time about everything that is going on, but they keep coming back week after week. They got the best seats in the house, and they use them only to criticize and to point their finger. And the only time they are happy is when somebody else makes a mistake. The only time they are happy is when they can critique what somebody else is doing. The only time they are happy is when they can boost somebody off the stage because they don't feel that they are worthy to be there. There are people like this in the world that are not Muppets. <laughs> you, did you know that? Have you ever met anybody like that? Did you know that people like this are strangely attracted to the church? <laughs> Come on. Amen. <laughs> Religion, more than anything else in the world, seems to attract critical people. Like moths drawn to a flame. Why? I've asked that question most of my life. Why? I mean, if, we, if this is really real, if what we're talking about is true, that we, we, we are serving a merciful God, infinite in His grace, who wants to redeem the world, then there shouldn't be many places left in the world that are more happy than this place. Happy is not always the first word that comes to mind when I walk into a church. Is it? Why? I think this is the answer. Religion convinces people that they are right about God. And when you are right about God, you must be right about everything. And if you are right about everything, then there's no need to open your heart up to anything else. I'll give Rubel Shelley the last word. Rubel has been a pastor, pastor to our own Olive family back in Nashville. He's been a writer, a university president, among many other things. I have several of his devotions. Many of them have come from Terry over the years that I like to read now and again. And this one is my favorite. He entitled it, How Religion Makes People Mean. I, I wish he was, you know, his subtlety is wonderful, isn't it? They just got right to the point. And more than losing a cell phone, Lord, deliver us from such a fate as being mean. This is what he writes. The bulk of the finest people I have ever known are devoutly religious. But some of the meanest people I've ever known are also among the most religious people I've ever encountered. If you think I'm making it up, that truly devout religious people can be mean-spirited and evil, just read the online comments made to stories in the New York Times or your local newspaper about evolution or homosexuality. The invective is too harsh to reproduce here. Some of the comments even use profanity, assign the godless evolutionists to hell, or tell the shameless perverts that God will damn them at the final judgment. I've read a few of those pieces that made me think the writer would actually kill somebody if he thought he could get away with it without being caught. Nobody ever read one of those postings and was helped to see what Jesus is like. To understand his mission to the lost. 
or want to become one of his followers. Religion can lead people to do hateful and wicked things to others, but loving and following Jesus will never do this. Well, aren't religion and following Jesus one and the same? Hardly. Religion is the system of beliefs and institutional loyalties one embraces, while following Jesus is the conscious imitation of the person one learns about in the Gospels. And the only people Jesus ever called names or declared in danger of hell were the most religious people of his time and place. They prayed, made pilgrimages, gave money, worshipped with pious looks on their faces and quoted scripture, but they had no clue about the loving, compassionate nature of God. Defending a pattern or system, proving that my church is better than yours, or trumping my argument with your counter-argument only breeds defensiveness. It makes tempers flare. It alienates friends. It starts wars. It makes people nasty, and it breaks God's heart. Following Jesus produces humility and keeps you from being mean. Because Jesus never said, be religious. Jesus said, follow me. May we pray together. Lord, may we move from our diligent work of condemning and categorizing and busy ourselves with the work of being saints, those who follow Jesus and love God and love our neighbors as we love ourselves, especially those whom God is seeking with all of his heart to give them life and life more abundantly than anything they have ever experienced. In Christ, the friend of sinners, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I invite you to come to the Lord's table this morning and share this great gift of God's grace. As uh, We're going to do a couple songs that Levon Helm did as well. This first song is actually not original with Levon Helm. It's a, it's a Carter family song. Anybody know the Carter family? Uh, it was written in 1930. And in this country in 1930, this country was in the midst of the worst economic collapse in history. And this great song is called No Depression in Heaven. And talked about the Great Depression here on earth, but how things would not be that way in Levon Helm covered this song with Cheryl Crow a few years ago. That's a magnificent piece to see. And uh, we can't equal that, but we want to share this song with you. hearts of men are failing for these latter days we know the great depression now is spreading God's word declared it would be so I'm going where there's no depression that lovely land free from care I'll leave this world of trouble 
My home's in heaven, I'm going there. This dark hour of midnight nearing and tribulation time will come. The storm will hurt and midnight fears and sweep millions to their doom. But I'm going where there's no depression. That lovely land that's free from care. I'll leave this world of trouble, my home's in heaven, I'm going there. bright land there'll be no hunger no orphan children crying for bread no weeping widows toil or struggle no shrouds no coffins and lord no death i'm going where there's no depression that lovely land that's free from care I'll leave this world of toil and trouble. My home's in heaven, I'm going there. Going where there's no depression, that lovely land that's free of care. I'll leave this world of trouble, my home's in heaven, I'm going there. My home's in heaven, I'm going there. There's a sorrow in the wind Blowing down the road I've been I can hear it cry My shadow steal the sun But I cannot look back now I've come too far to turn around And there's still the race that I must run I'm only halfway home I got a journey on to where I'll find the things that I've lost I've come a long long road still I've got miles to go I've got a wide wide river to cross I have stumbled I have strayed you can trace the tracks I've made all across the memories my heart recalls but I'm just a refugee Won't you say a prayer for me 
Cause sometimes even the strongest soldier fall I'm only halfway home I got a journey on To where I'll find The things that I've lost I've come a long, long road Still I've got miles to go I've got a wide, wide river to cross I've got a wide, wide river to cross As we... As we pray together this this uh, morning, uh, Judy and and uh, Craig went flying off to Jacksonville in the middle of the night, hoping for a, a transplant, and it ended up being a dry run. But they're leaving in the morning to go back to Jacksonville to to reside. Got everything worked out, so uh, they're going to be living there close by, and that improves the chances of getting placed on the the transplant list. So our prayers go with you, beginning tomorrow. Ed Stewart passed away this past week after what can only be described as a heroic uh, stand against against cancer. His uh, memorial service is Thursday at 2 o'clock at the Community Church of Santa Rosa Beach. And, uh, and uh, Susan's been gone uh, to El Salvador. Our El Salvador team is back safe and sound, so we're glad about that. <laughs> but in lieu of flowers, and the reason I bring up Susan, in lieu of flowers, we haven't had a chance to talk about this. Uh, donations can be made uh, to the Stewart Memorial Fund here at A Simple Faith, and we'll sort all that out later. So uh, uh, tremendous amount of medical bills and things like that, so the family elected to do that. But that's 2 o'clock Thursday, so please keep uh, the family in your prayers and uh, hope to, if you can, be able to attend that service. So let's pray together and take take hands with our neighbors. Lord, we thank you for your love and grace that you are the seeker of us all and that you welcome us into your arms and into your home and under your roof and help us to have that kind of grace where uh, we, we get out of the judging business and get into the following Christ business. Help us do that. It's so difficult at times in this angry, polarizing, difficult world in which we live. And yet it is in this difficult world that we have been called to be disciples of Jesus. Help us to do that. For Craig and for Judy, for the Stewart family, we give you our, our prayers and ask that you be with them. For the safe return of our El Salvador team, we say thank you. And for all the great work, we look forward to hearing about all they've done there. And on this day, this beautiful day, this lays out before us, give us your grace and your mercy for what we may face. As Jesus taught us to pray, we pray boldly. Our Father. our offertory song I think I think Levon covered this one <laughs> never meant to cause you any sorrow Never meant to cause you any pain. Only one time to see you laughing. There's the punchline. I only want to see you laughing in that purple rain. Purple rain. Purple. Purple rain. 
purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. I only wanna see you laughing in that purple rain. Every move I make, I'm making you, you make me move. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you, you are my way. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Waves of mercy, waves of mercy. Every move I make, I'm making you, you make me move. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you, you are my way. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Waves of mercy, waves of grace. Everywhere I look, I see your face, your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love, how can it be? Have a great week.